Thank you everyone for joining. And welcome to this morning's first Saturday PDX webinar and presentation. For those who are new to our program, First Saturday PDX is a monthly continuing education series cover, which covers a wide range of Chinese history, culture, and art-related topics. All of our programs are free and open to the public. And this year, we celebrate our 20th season of programming. Our committee is hard at work and we will be putting on um, a 20th anniversary celebration in February. The title of today's talk is The Real Milan, Tales of a Female Rebel in 18th Century China. And we're pleased to welcome a new speaker to our series today, Dr. Cecily McCaffrey, Associate Professor of History at Willamette University. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items and announcements. So the format of today's presentation includes a few introductory remarks, a 45 minute presentation, followed by Q&A. At the conclusion of the Q&A session, we'll take a five minute break before starting an optional virtual first Saturday tea house. For those who used to be with us, we had an optional luncheon. Now that we're virtual, we've transformed that into a virtual tea house. If you wish to join the tea house, you'll need to exit the webinar at, at its conclusion, um, at, the, at its conclusion, and then go to the second Zoom link um, for the tea house, which will be found in your confirmation email, which you received. The slide shows where those links are. So today's presentation is in webinar format. And you'll notice that everyone in the audience is muted and unseen. Um, I'm able to see a list of all the participants. I just see your names. And it looks like we have about 28 people um, viewing us right now. So thank you all for joining us. If you are dialing in with your phone, please um, mute your phone so that you'll be able to hear the presentation better. For the Q&A session, please use the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. To open the box, click on the icon that says Q&A. A box will pop up in the middle of your screen, but you'll be able to click and drag it to the side and also resize it. Feel free to submit questions throughout the talk our Q&A moderator will then read the questions at the end of the presentation, and our speaker will answer as many as time allows. A note about troubleshooting, any te technical difficulties that you might have. For those who might have a weaker Wi-Fi signal, you might experience some audio or video, video freezing up. You can try these three things. First, wait a few seconds and it might clear up leave the webinar and come back. Or third, if you're still having difficulties, you can use the call-in option with your phone. And lastly, please note that we are recording today's presentation and it will be available on our YouTube channel at a future date. We'll be announcing when it does go live on the YouTube channel. Our first Saturday program committee would also like to acknowledge our close partnerships and relationships with like-minded organizations in Portland, particularly with the Lan Su Chinese Garden, the Northwest China Council, and our co-sponsorship partner, Portland State University's Institute for Asian Studies. Suwaka Watanabe, director of PSU's Institute for Asian Studies, when, was unable to join us today, however, sent us a slide and wished to invite our viewers to the following two upcoming virtual public events. On November 10th, there'll be a town, China Town Hall, which is sponsored by the Northwest China Council, co-sponsored by Portland State Institute for Asian Studies. And then on November, 14th, or November 19th, excuse me, a lecture focused on Korea, entitled Korean Families Yesterday and Today and Tomorrow by PSU sociology professor, Dr. Hei Young Wu. For details about the Chinatown Hall, please visit the Northwest China Council website. And for the Focus on Korea lecture, please contact Suwaka Watanabe. 
Her email is posted on the screen. And now I'd like to introduce Charlene Rogers of the First Saturday Program Committee, who will introduce today's speaker. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you out there. Uh, Dr. Cecily McCaffrey is Associate Professor of History at Willamette University, where she teaches East Asian history. A specialist in modern Chinese history, she holds degrees from Tufts, her BA, a master's from the University of California at Berkeley, and a PhD from the University of California at San Diego. Her primary research focus is religiously inspired rebellion in the Qing dynasty. Current projects include a study of the old forests of central China as they have been represented through time. Please join me in welcoming Cecily McCaffrey to First Saturday for her presentation. Hello everyone, it's so nice to be with you this morning. Um, I wanted to start off today actually by thanking uh, the organizers. It's really just such, um, it's been such a pleasure to work with Catherine and Ling and Jennifer, who are the folks I've had the chance to meet so far. Um, you all are so lucky to have them. They are wonderful, um, just have made this whole process so smooth and easy, and I really appreciate that. Um, I want to, before I share my slide, I just want to give you a sense of um, the way I'd like to move forward today. I, I'll introduce you to uh, the heroine that we'll be speaking about um, and focus on her um, 18th century history before moving forward through time uh, to talk about the way she's been represented in both the 19th and the 20th centuries. So the uh, title of my talk today is The Real Mulan. Uh, is she truly the real Mulan? Uh, Tales of a female rebel in 18th century China. I'd like to start by introducing you to Wang Tsongar. Uh, we don't have an exact sense of her birth date, but we do know that she uh, died in 1798, sort of in the course of the rebellion uh, with which she was involved. Uh, most of the information that I'm sharing with you comes from the imperial records, so the court records of the rebellion in which she was uh, involved. And this information about her has been um, replicated in other histories of her as well. Uh, so she was a native of Xiangyang Prefecture in the northwestern region of Hubei province in central China. And I'll show you a map in just a second to give you a sense of where that is. She was married to uh, a man named Qi Lin, who was also native to Xiangyang Prefecture. And he was a high ranking teacher in a popular religious network that was quite right widespread in central China in the 1790s. So Qi Lin uh, was actually arrested and executed in 1794 um, and he had been caught up in a court campaign against these popular religious groups that took place between 1794 and 1795. So he had been targeted as a key um, leader in this movement in Hubei province. Wang Tsongar actually moved into her husband's position in the religious group and thereby assumed a leadership role in the sect. Uh, this sect then went on to actually rise up in active revolt against the Qing state in 1796, um, at which point uh, Wang and another um, high-ranking teacher, a fellow disciple of her husband actually, named Yao Zhifu, uh, led thousands of followers into battle against Qing dynasty for forces. This group um, proved to be particularly successful. Um, they endured in their rebellion for two years. Uh, they were known uh, at, for adopting essentially guerrilla tactics. Uh, the places they were active were quite mountainous, actually. These are the mountains of uh, Northwestern uh, Hubei and also Eastern Sichuan province. And so they would often break up into small groups, uh, use tactics of uh, retreat and ambush, uh, sort of split up and reunite in different places. And so they essentially always um, stayed one step ahead of the government troops that were sent to quell them. Uh, Wang moved uh, freely with her um, followers between different regions uh, of uh, these mountainous borderlands. Uh, and on occasion, they would uh, also join up with other rebel groups that were active in the broader 
area as well. Uh, however, ultimately, both Wang, Yao, and uh, their thousands of followers were um, trapped, uh, encircled by Qing troops on a remote peak in northwestern Hubei in 1798, the end of two years of open revolt. At this point, neither surrender nor compromise was an option for these two leaders. And so with their defeat looming, the two leapt off of a cliff and killed themselves rather than face capture, torture, and execution. The image that I've put on the side of the slide, for those of you who are able to see it, um, comes from a uh, 1970s uh, history of Wong uh, and the this is her essentially leaping off of the cliff. This became a very iconic um, vision. And the banner she's carrying um, basically marks the, the, the Xiangyang, her local um, rebel band. So it, it, the, to see that flag, that pennant um, symbolizes her as a leader. Um, but as I'll be discussing later on, uh, this, this sort of act of leaping off the cliff um, is something that became uh, very much associated with Wang and was later interpreted in 20th century histories as being an act of sacrifice for rebellion. So I want to give you a, a just a quick sense of, of the area that we're talking about here. This next slide um, is a map of the Qing Dynasty uh, provinces of China circa uh, early 19th century. And the darker slide I'm highlighted in the middle there is Hubei province. This is Wang Tsongar's native province. Um, this is the place where the rebellion began, but then it spread um, westward towards uh, both Sichuan and Shanxi provinces, which are located um, just to the west and northwest of the highlighted slide. This next image, um, these are photos I took, um, oh gosh, a while ago in 2013 uh, in northwestern Hubei. This is actually the uh, Shennongjia Forest Preserve, if you ever have the chance to travel in western China. Um, but this is uh, generally in the rough area where um, the rebels were particularly active, um, sort of hiding in mountain, mountain redoubts. So I've included these uh, slides just to give you a sense of uh, the, a feel for the area. I'm quite wooded, uh, dense, uh, not very many um, roads or pathways to use. So you can sort of just imagine a very remote and mountainous and forested region. In order to give you some context for Wang's rebellion, I want to speak just a little bit about the tradition of sectarian religion uh, in Qing China, specifically uh, this tradition that is colloquially referred to as the White Lotus tradition. The image I provided for you here is um, a, a statue of the Maitreya Buddha, the Buddha of the future, who is actually standing on a lotus throne. And uh, lotus, the lotus flower is quite symbolic, of course, because it grows out of the mud. A white lotus represents sort of purity um, growing out of, uh, sort of dirt, shall we say. So it's a very potent image. Uh, in terms of uh, what was happening in central China in the 18th century, we should understand this religious tradition as being part of um, a long-standing tradition of popular religious practices. Um, it was particularly active in North and central China in the 18th century. This label of white lotus was used uh, to describe a loosely organized grouping of popular sects that subscribe to some tenets of Buddhism. Um, and this included a, a focus on uh, millenarian uh, aspects of the religion, um, understanding time to be divided into past, present, and future eras, wherein each era was governed by a past, present, and future Buddha respectively. And most important to these sectarian beliefs was a belief in the um, Maitreya Buddha as a salvationist uh, sort of figure that a sighting of the um, Maitreya Buddha would indicate that the, the future era was soon to arrive. This, uh, these popular religious groups also um, honored uh, a figure called the Eternal Venerable Mother, the uh, Everlasting Mother, who was understood to be a creationist figure, um, 
the progenitor of humankind and also like the Madreya Buddha um, operating as a savior of um, the faithful. So there's definitely a salvationist um, tendency here. And so the members of the religious sects and their teachers looked for signs that there would be a, a turn of an era, um, in which case their own faithfulness to the, both the eternal venerable mother and their belief in the Maitreya Buddha uh, would protect them. And their duties when these signs appeared uh, were, were that they would have to um, assist uh, the transfer from the old to the new order. So in central China in 1789, uh, as it turns out, uh, following uh, some 15 years after a pre pre previous revolt, um, the Wanglun uprising that had taken place in North China um, along uh, similar lines, we began to see um, calls for a new era to arise. And uh, the, the signs were that um, people identified, sect teachers identified incarnations of the Maitreya Buddha, um, children who represented um, the, re the, the second coming or the new coming of uh, the Buddha figures. And one of these was a man named uh, Leo Jushia. And Leo was well connected in these sectarian networks and enjoyed a pedigree that connected him to respected um, teachers in the tradition. Leo, um, we should understand him as being one generation above Qi Lin and Wong Song R. So um, they were um, sort of part of the same uh, general hierarchy. However, um, in the campaign that I mentioned earlier of 1794 and 1795, um, when the court getting wind of uh, these talks of apocalypse and Maitreya Buddha's um, incarnate on the earth ordered um, an investigation and arrest, um, they also sought to uh, arrest Leo Jushia. Um, and so Leo ended up working underground following Qi Lin's arrest and death uh, with Wang Song R, uh, her fellow disciple Yao Jifu, and other sectarians who were active in Xiangyang Prefecture to prepare for the coming of a new era. So essentially they were looking forward to this uh, future world era, uh, which would uh, augur tremendous changes throughout society. They chose an auspicious date in the um, traditional sexagenary cycle, which um, in the Western calendar translates to April 17th, 1796 for their rebellion. Now the campaign against the sects on the part of the court um, actually uh, led to uh, a lot of tension throughout fellow uh, religious communities with the result that the rebellion actually began two months prior to the date that had been set because um, followers in Southern Hubei were quite worried about impending arrests and so decided to revolt early essentially to save themselves. A, a common slogan was better to revolt than to face arrest. However, um, Wang Songar and Yao Jifu and their followers in, in uh, Xiangyang province in the northern part of Hubei did follow the original plan and led their followers uh, into revolt on the specified date of April 17th, 1796. Now, the other leader that I mentioned, Liu Jushia, actually did not enter the revolt. Um, he stayed underground. He was ultimately captured by the Qing court in 1800. So of that group, Wang and Yao were the most um, preeminent leaders coming from that area of Northwestern Hubei. Now, we don't have very much information about Wang Tsongar. As I mentioned, there is some information about her in the imperial records, um, but there is uh, nothing that is firsthand. She does not speak in the historical sources and nor do any of her friends and family. However, uh, when we think about the ways in which Wang is represented um, in these limited source materials, it is possible to distinguish between two views of Wang. So that of her fellow rebels and that of the Qing officers who were um, who basically pursued her um, for the two years that she was active in rebellion. 
So I wanted to start with thinking of the ways that um, Wong's comrades or fellows viewed her. And the image that I'm using for this slide, um, I thought represented this idea of, of Wong's authority in the rebellion. It is um, somewhat fanciful. It comes from a uh, 1970s account of Wong as one of many uh, so-called peasant revolutionary heroines. And I'll speak about that uh, a little bit more later on. But uh, as you'll see in this image, uh, Wong is pointing to a map, so suggesting her strategic planning um, and guidance of the revolt. And there is a group of men uh, who are uh, the, the signal uh, that they are uh, rebel followers actually relates to the the white scarves that they have tied around their heads. This was often used as a as a marker um, for uh, fellow members of the rebel band. So they are all, of course, uh, listening to her, watching her um, guidance uh, attentively. And this actually does reflect the ways in which other rebels uh, talk about Wong um, when they are uh, interrogated by the Qing. The Qing Dynasty officials who uh, interrogated those who were captured were very interested in the chain of command. Whom should they be targeting? Um, what were, in what directions were the rebels moving? And so when we see reference to Wang Songar, essentially these references confirm that she was high ranking in the local religious hierarchy and also that she was a recognized leader of the movement. Now it's in some ways difficult to specifically locate um, Wong as a leader in the religious hierarchy because um, we don't have a lot of direct references. So although some of the um, rebels identified themselves as being disciples of Yao Jifu, who was her fellow um, leader in the rebellion, very few acknowledge direct contact uh, with Wang Tsung'ar. And my interpretation of that is that it's best to understand her position um, in, term, in the context of the ways in which these sects were organized hierarchically. So the fact that Wang had close connections both to um, her deceased husband, Qi Lin, and also the leader, Liu Zhixie, uh, those were both distinguishing characteristics and marked her um, as a fellow to other leaders in the region. And so if we think about the hierarchy as actually reflecting a genealogy of power, her position in that hierarchy um, then meant that her authority among um, other sectarians was unquestioned. Now, there are some who have written about um, Wang Sangar who suggest that she um, was a leader of other female um, religious followers in particular, and that this meant that she had the title of number two teacher within the sect. It's hard to find a lot of support for these claims. There is one report um, from 1797 that a, uh, another female rebel leader who was captured um, had been a disciple of Wang Tsung'ar. So we do have that in the official rebel, sorry, the official record. Um, but it was much more common to see affirmations among other leaders um, that Wang was a fellow leader of um, a different group. So for example, um, a leader of a different cohort testified to the Qing officials that all of the male leaders in the contingent that Wang led were in fact Wang's disciples. So again, we get this evidence that um, she's, she's positioned as a leader, even if we don't have um, people directly testifying that she was their personal religious teacher. And the final example that we have in the record um, that speaks to Wang's authority among her fellows actually comes um, after her death um, in the case of a man named Wang Tianwang. Uh, and Wang actually plotted uh, a, a separate and it turned out short-lived revolt in southeastern Hubei uh, in 1798. He had not joined the original rebellion two years prior that began in 1796. However, um, when he learned that uh, Wang Tsung'ar uh, had died in the conflict, um, that summer, he himself was inspired to action. And in his own uh, deposition um, that he delivered when he was captured, he said, quote, Wang Songar always treated me well, so I wanted to avenge her death. 
Now, the group that we have much more information about uh, is that of the Qing officials. And so I turn now to what we might call imperial or official uh, views of Wang Songar in the historical record. And uh, certainly the official reports um, that came from the Qing armies who were fighting against the rebels affirmed Wang's leadership position. And we would we see in reports um, from Qing generals uh, referring to that refer to Wang's uh, tactical decisions. Uh, so we we see her named as as a leader in terms of oh well her group went in this direction, um, for example. So we see her referenced as a leader consistently. But it's important to note as well that the the tenor of the reports that are written by Wang in official hand is is significantly distinct from the tone of respect that you hear from her fellow rebels um, in their own depositions and confessions so to cite one example from a commander writing about Wang Songar in early 1798 he writes uh, Wang is the most crafty of all the rebel leaders uh, and as the Qing troops suffer, uh, uh, defeats might be the wrong word, but uh, an, an inability to, to capture Wang and her followers. Um, we keep hearing stories of how the rebels had uh, eluded them and the emperor then begins to label Wang and Yao as being the most important criminals and those against whom imperial attentions should be directed. Uh, so although it's, sort of scattered, the general tenor of the representation of Wang in the record is that of, an, of a resilient opponent um, whose ire actually att attracts, uh, whose actions, sorry, actually attract the ire of the emperor himself. Uh, and so I include here on this slide um, a short passage that's actually written by the Jiaqing emperor himself. And this is written uh, years after her death, actually in 1803, um, but he's writing more generally about against the perpetuation of transgressive activities in local society. And so I, I'll go ahead and uh, read this for you because I think it's really a fascinating passage um, for us to analyze. He writes, there are those who perform tricks with weapons on horseback, including ac acrobatics. And he lists here a number of different um, tactics um, that refer to different acrobatic uh, techniques. Men and women mingle together in these activities. This is harmful to the common good. In the past, the religious rebel leader Wang Song R was one of these so-called horse and weapons entertainers. At the start, she bewitched people with her licentious acts. Soon they were colluding in rebellion. These kinds of activities should be sternly prescribed in order to amend popular custom. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Chinese imperial rhetoric will recognize the implications of this passage, um, specifically that unrestrained behavior on the part of individuals, even if seemingly benign, who knew that acrobatics was so dangerous, uh, nevertheless has the potential to undermine the social order. Furthermore, Wang's purported participation in public performances signaled an aberration from the elite ideal of female seclusion, the idea that women should uh, be uh, only active in the domestic sphere and uh, remain in the inner quarters. And of course, the reference to Wang's licentiousness in this passage is a signal there um, that she is behaving against the norm. And if we recognize the centrality of gender norms to Confucian society and ideas of proper behavior, we can understand uh, Wang's actions in the emperor's representation to be doubly dangerous. So not only is, does, is she rebelling against the state, um, but her acts are actually going against Confucian standards of female propriety. So uh, we see in this passage then a characterization of Wang that goes beyond her role specifically as a leader in the rebellion um, and now is beginning to attach um, 
I guess, to, for lack of a better word, more moral attributes to, or immoral attributes to Wong. Uh, elites who write about the rebellion after its conclusion uh, in 1804, um, when they focus on Wong Tsung uh, they likewise present a very moral evaluation. Uh, so the next um, passage that we're going to look at uh, comes from uh, a moral tract that was published in 1826, so um, some decades after the rebellion concluded, uh, by an author who um, named himself the scholar from Stone Fragrance Village. And so he includes, uh, he write the tract itself is called Narrative of the Suppression of the Religious Rebels. So it's a larger history um, of the rebellion. But his, uh, he discusses Wong Song Ar specifically um, in a section that details the lives of the rebel leaders. And uh, he provides a short biography of Wong that briefly outlines uh, her involvement in the rebellion, uh, but the majority of his, his writings on Wong assesses her character in historical context. He compares her uh, to so-called female banditi who have contributed to social upheaval and contrasts her to exemplary women who took action in defense of righteousness. After extolling the exemplary woman he names as truly commendable, uh, he continues in the passage that I've accepted for you on this slide. And again, I'll read it for you. Alas, the rebels have destroyed everything with their unfathomable sorcery. We have no Mulan, no Mother Lu, no General Pan, nor Chin Lian Yu wise, brave, and extraordinary teachers of the inner chambers. The bandits have spread their poison and reduced the pure and good to a powder. How tragic. The widow's beauty and manner were seductive, her limbs delicate and fine, yet she kept company with wolves and swine, running wild in the mountains, leading well-known thieves and famous bandits. Truly, she is a demon. Now, there is, a, I find this is just such a wonderful passage, I think, as a historian to examine. Um, there is so much contained in this short uh, section. The first thing to highlight is Wang Tsongar was most often referred to as Widow Qin, uh, so the widow of Qi. Uh, Qi Min, uh, her husband who had died in 1794. Uh, so, uh, Clearly, you can see here that stark contrast between a woman like Wang Tsung Ar and then uh, these legendary uh, female woman warriors. Um, all of these uh, so-called extraordinary teachers of the inner chambers. And here, this is a reference to um, the, uh, the inner quarters, uh, the domestic realm that was supposed to be um, women's purview. Uh, so on the one hand, we have reference to a tradition of women leaving the inner chambers, but for the right purpose, uh, those who are wise and, wise and brave, uh, those who took up weapons for morally defensible reasons, uh, contrasted with Wong, uh, who is literally wild right it is uncultured she is uh, seen as keeping company with wild animals running wild in the mountains uh, being a member of a, a so-called bandit game uh, gang and then that last point of, of naming her a demon really says she's beyond the pale of humanity she can't be considered um, human uh, due to her behavior that uh, she is uh, not at all fit for human society. The last uh, thing that I'd like to draw your attention to here, however, is the, the line in the middle of that passage where he says, the widow's beauty and manner were seductive, her limbs delicate and fine. Uh, it's quite fascinating that he sort of inserts uh, attention to uh, her uh, physical and sexual persona, that he's adding yet another uh, layer here that to me harks back to the Qianlong, uh, sorry, the Jiaqing Emperor's uh, comment that she was, quote, licentious. Um, and so he's in one way signaling Wang's femininity, 
uh, as distinctive, and on the other, labeling it under these sort of stark moral terms. So at this point, it seemed appropriate to pause and spend a minute with Mulan uh, and the legend of Mulan. And I hope you will indulge me in allowing me to read to you um, one of the, the first um, poems, the, sometimes it's called the Ballad of Mulan or the Old of Mulan. Uh, it was composed in the fifth or sixth century of the Common Era. And this is uh, essentially what scholars have identified as our first textual reference on the legend of Mulan. So I've excerpted a, a very short piece here on the slide, um, but I, I'll go ahead and read you the poem in its entirety, um, just to highlight the stark contrast between the way that someone like Mulan is represented in the literary tradition, and then the way that someone like Wang Tsumar is opposed to the figure of Mulan in the literary tradition. So, tisk tisk, and again, tisk tisk, Mulan weaves facing the door. You don't hear the shuttle sound. You only hear daughter's sighs. They ask daughter who's in her heart. They ask daughter who's on her mind. No one is on daughter's heart. No one is on daughter's mind. Last night, I saw the draft posters. The Khan is calling many troops. The army list isn't 12 scrolls. On every scroll, there's father's name. Father has no grown up son. Mulan has no old elder brother. I want to buy a saddle and a horse and serve in the army in father's place. In the East Market, she buys a spirited horse. In the West Market, she buys a saddle. In the South Market, she buys a bridle. In the North Market, she buys a long whip. At dawn, she takes leave of father and mother. In the evening, camps on the Yellow River's bank. She doesn't hear the sound of father and mother calling. She only hears the Yellow River's flowing water cry, Sin, Sin. At dawn, she takes leave of the Yellow River. In the evening, she arrives at Black Mountain. She doesn't hear the sound of father and mother calling. She only hears Mount Yen's nomad horses cry, Siu, Siu. She goes 10,000 miles on the business of war. She crosses passes and mountains like flying. Northern gusts carry the rattle of army pots. Chilly light shines on iron armor. Generals die in a hundred battles. Stout soldiers return after 10 years. On her return, she sees the son of heaven. The son of heaven sits in the splendid hall. He gives out promotions in 12 ranks and prizes of 100,000 and more. The Khan asks her what she desires. Mulan has no use for a minister's post. I wish to ride a swift mount to take me back to my home. When father and mother hear daughter is coming, they go outside the wall to meet her leaning on each other. When elder sister hears younger sister is coming, she fixes her rouge facing the door. When little brother hears elder sister is coming, he wets his knife quick, quick for pig and sheep. I open the door to my east chamber. I sit on my couch in the west room. I take off my wartime gown and put on my old time clothes. Facing the window, she fixes her cloud-like hair. Hanging up a mirror, she dabs on yellow flower powder. She goes out the door and sees her comrades. Her comrades are all amazed and perplexed. Traveling together for 12 years, they didn't know Mulan was a girl. The he hair's feet go hop and skip. The she hair's eyes are muddled and fuddled. Two hairs running side by side, close to the ground. How can they tell if I am a he or she? So this uh, poem, I'll be happy to speak with you in the Q&A section to unpack it a little bit. Um, but uh, one theme that comes through quite clearly is that of um, loyalty to family, respect for parents, uh, serving the empire, uh, not interested in prizes of uh, position or money. She just sought to serve and essentially to save uh, her father from harm. So if there is any uh, 
theme in this poem, I would say, it is that of filial piety and loyalty. In some ways, Wang, sorry, Mulan taking up arms uh, is, is less of a focus than uh, the extremes to which she will go uh, in order to uh, support her family uh, and her parents in particular. Now, as I think many of us are familiar, the legend of Mulan uh, has grown and grown and been reproduced in uh, other poems that reference this one uh, in plays and films in Disney animated and uh, live features, for example. So it's a story whose telling um, has been compelling, uh, not only uh, within China, but throughout the world as well. Uh, but when we think back to uh, this particular historical moment in the 19th century, when a scholar is uh, writing against uh, the moral failings of a Wong Songar, we can see the significance of Mulan as a counterpoint. Um, all of the women that the scholar mentions uh, are martial women. They have all taken up arms. Uh, to for righteous causes, uh, for example, acting out of filial piety or reacting to injustice or immorality or defending uh, the realm. But if we add all of this together, we see that Wang is being critiqued perhaps less for her militarism, but rather for the group uh, with which she has aligned herself or her allegiances. Now, just as the figure of Mulan uh, has gathered a variety of attributes and, and the retelling of the story throughout the ages, um, so too do we see the, the tales of Wong Songar begin to acquire uh, new patinas as well. And one of these is uh, that of the um, female uh, knight errant, so to speak, or the um, a martial woman. Uh, and in a passage from 1874 in uh, a, a literary collectania, sort of miscellaneous sayings, this one happened to be called Burying the Sorrows, uh, the author also uh, penned a short biography of Wong, uh, but here he gave her um, martial talents as well. So whereas the earlier representations that I shared with you focus more on um, a fixation on Wong's immoral qualities. Uh, in this passage, we see a, a much more um, active or dynamic image of Wong Song R. And so I've accept, excerpted that from for you here. Uh, the image that I provide actually comes from a much later source. Um, it's a tale of a female knight errant, uh, but it, it seems a fitting illustration for the passage here that I'll read for you now. Tradition has it that whenever Widow Chi went into battle, she wore a pheasant feather headdress and a red brocade war robe. She wielded two swords on horseback, strong and quick, she was never struck down. One time she raised one foot, like a crane, and from the top of the mountain careened down to the bottom, rushing down slopes and leaping ravines, never losing step. One can imagine her strength and agility. Now, I, I feel obliged to point out, I have never seen any reference to Wong in the official records of the rebellion that speak of a pheasant feather headdress nor a red brocade war robe. Um, so here I would say that the author seems to be drawing on a much broader tradition of um, literary works that depict um, these uh, martial women, these female knight errants, which is a, a very well established uh, genre in the Chinese literary tradition. Uh, it includes enough details to keep it um, close to uh, the reality, namely that Wang was quite active in mountainous regions and certainly um, some of the uh, depictions that were favorable to the Qing's uh, pursuit of the rebels suggested that they, the the rebels seem to have almost magical characteristics that they could, you know, sort of disappear from one place and pop up in another. Uh, and so this depiction of Wong 
is certainly in keeping with that as well. But what fascinates me about this particular account is that I see it as being yet another layer being applied to Wong's persona. Again, we, we don't know very much about her from the direct historical sources, but as you add all of these different layers of representation together, it, we're, we're getting a picture of a woman who is on the one hand, young, lithe, seductive, beautiful, um, but also vicious, wild, um, hard to control, and now this more mystical or magical attribute of, of being able to sort of fly through the air, wield uh, multiple swords uh, while standing on horseback. It certainly is a very evocative image. So I'm going to jump us forward about a century to think about uh, more contemporary representations of Wong Sung Ar. And we're actually jumping ahead to the People's Republic period um, to the 1970s. Uh, and I've included here a, a poster um, from that time. Uh, the caption reads, we are all sharpshooters. Um, but like this poster, uh, later histories of Wong Sung Ar appeared in popular histories of the White Lotus uprising that were published uh, in the late 70s, essentially at the tail end of the Cultural Revolution. Now, those histories um, emphasized uh, class-based struggle against feudalism, so very much in keeping with um, PRC uh, rhetoric, particularly that being uh, propagated during the Cultural Revolution itself. So biographies of Wong that are produced at this time uh, portray her as being motivated by righteous anger at the conditions of poverty that surround her existence. So we've moved away from the religious motivations for the revolt, and in its place are put a kind of appropriate anti-feudalist uh, ideology on the part of Wong. I mentioned earlier that Wong's uh, suicide leaping off of the cliff is something that became very iconic in latter day representations of her. Uh, and this comes through in these 1970s histories, uh, wherein her suicide is portrayed as a sacrifice. Um, it's part of her revolt against feudalism and patriarchy. So essentially she's sacrificing herself uh, to, the, to the righteousness of her cause. And these depictions, certainly fit um, in with the histories that are being produced at that time, but they also conform to state promotion of so-called iron girls as gender and labor models in the 1960s and 1970s. And the iron girl model was put forward to really encourage women's contribution, both to labor um, for the nation, but also um, to serve the nation uh, in much broader terms. And so this, uh, poster here, We Are All Sharpshooters, speaks to women basically arming themselves as part of the popular militia that was expected to defend the nation should the occasion arise. Now, returning uh, to the ways in which Wong is represented uh, in the 1970s, uh, there are numerous publications uh, dedicated to peasant revolutionary heroes or revolutionary heroines. And so uh, Wong is referred to uh, as occupying a commanding role. So for example, one title she's given is uh, commander of the eight armies, uh, suggesting that Wong was in control of the entirety uh, of the uprising, which does not necessarily conform with the historical record as we know it. Uh, other attributes that are uh, given to Wong at this time, uh, which tie in with Maoist preoccupations with class background, uh, include her being born into an extremely poor family. Uh, the narrative uh, has uh, Wong and her mother uh, forced by poverty to take to the roads as traveling performers. This is a, a sort of low ranking uh, occupation in the Qing dynasty. Uh, there is mention of this harks back to the representation by the Qianlong, uh, sorry, I keep making that flip, the Jia Qing emperor, um, to her being part of an acrobatic troupe where she learns to ride horses, walk a tightrope, and perform martial arts. Um, 
but also that her um, revolutionary consciousness uh, is activated by what she sees. Uh, she witnesses uh, the people suffering among her and quote, the fire of resistance that burned in her belly grew stronger every day. Uh, her revolt then is to overthrow the corrupt chain. And again, I quote from uh, a history call for, called Peasant Revolutionary Heroines, uh, that she is to overthrow the corrupt Qing and seize her own liberation. Now, notably, uh, Wang's involvement in the uh, popular religious sect is essentially elided in these 1970s accounts. From the Maoist perspective, popular religious practice would have been considered a feudal remnant of the old society, little more than superstition and chicanery um, that distracts people from the appropriate progress of class struggle. Uh, authors writing about Wang in this time period uh, cite Frederick Engels to support an argument that even though the White Lotus movement was uh, centered on popular religious beliefs, in reality, it reflected the peasants' violent reaction to class oppression. So we can see here um, a rewriting of the history of the rebellion to fit more um, Maoist dictates. Another argu author argued that Wang and her husband, Shilin had used the White Lotus sect as essentially a false front to secretly organize peasants for rebellion, and furthermore, that the rebels followed communal principles and stole from the rich to give to the poor. Uh, so in all of these histories, then, we have a, a logic of revolt that very much ties into a revolutionary heritage. In other words, Wang is being presented as a predecessor of the Iron Girls, who are supposed to be active in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, just to give you a little bit more detail of the way in which uh, Wang is represented uh, in these histories, uh, the rebellion uh, starts on her command. Uh, she is uh, hailed as a talented and compassionate leader who accompanies her followers into battle, sharing their joys and their pains. Uh, because uh, she is so talented, her fellows push her together as the supreme commander of the eight armies. Uh, so you remember I mentioned that she was given this title, commander of the eight armies. She's portrayed as being resolute to the very end when she and her followers are encircled on the mountaintop arrows gone and food exhausted, they continue to throw stones at the enemy and her leap from the cliff is presented as a courageous act. And I quote uh, again from the history that refers to her as a revolutionary heroism, a heroine, uh, in order to affect the liberation of the working classes and overthrow the yoke of Confucianism and feudal class structures, Wang Sungar made the ultimate sacrifice. She offered her own precious body. And this next slide uh, shows the, the concluding statement uh, made by this author. Wang Sungar led hundreds of thousands in revolt. They battled their way north and south, never bat wavering in their historic, heroic mission. Not only does she personify the wisdom and courage of our country's working women, but she has also delivered a stream critique of the Confucian tenet that men are superior to women. She adds a shining page to the history of our country's peasant wars. Now, reading this, you might remark on the ways in which it contrasts um, so starkly with the representations of Wang by Confucian elites. Uh, in the Qing dynasty, the emperor's representation, uh, the scholar's representation of Wang uh, certainly portrayed her as being, uh, you know, much more dangerous and wild and malevolent and licentious as opposed to uh, heroic and courageous. Uh, and just to highlight the connection to uh, the contemporary discourse in which this history was produced, um, I have included a poster here. Um, that comes from a wonderful website. I hope some of you have seen this already, um, chineseposters.net, where you can just kind of scroll through all of these um, posters from the Maoist era 
uh, and beyond. But this uh, poster is titled Bombard the Classic of Women, which is, I think, speaking directly to this idea that women need to step out of the traditional role um, that was given to them in Confucian society. And so these women in this picture are not just preparing themselves for war, um, but actually also battling against uh, these older ideas. So the last place that I will bring you now is to uh, the contemporary period. Uh, and now you see that my title is not original. I actually take it quite deliberately um, from a TV series. This TV series uh, is called Warrior Woman. Um, it was originally produced by Discovery Canada. It's actually going on about 20 years old now. Um, I stumbled across it um, years ago. Um, I've been working on this project kind of, it's been back burner for quite a while. So I come and go, I return to it um, on occasion. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to return to it with you um, today, actually. Um, but anyways, it was produced by Discovery Canada. It's narrated by Lucy Lawless that some of you may remember is playing the role of Xena Warrior Princess. I think we're going back to the 90s. Um, but the real Mulan in this TV series is no other than Wan Song R. Um, you can actually, it's now streaming on Amazon Prime. Um, it has, I. this is a, a very new um, distribution. I've, I've never seen it being offered uh, in that format. I'm guessing that the Disney Mulan that's just been released recently has inspired um, producing this uh, for popular distribution again. Uh, but uh, let me run you through uh, the, this latter day representation of Wang Sungar as kind of our, our final foray into the different tales of the female rebel. Uh, so the premise of this um, particular series is that Wong Song R is the real Mulan. She is the uh, a historical representative of the Mulan legend uh, that, that she is bringing Mulan to life, so to speak. Uh, when you watch this segment, if you do, uh, I did, um, you might see that much of the narrative of Mulan as presented in this series uh, remains in tandem. Uh, with the 1970s account. So for example, Wang is said to have been born into poverty. Um, it's said that she learns martial arts techniques uh, as a traveling performer. Uh, she, uh, it acknowledges her marriage to Chi Lin, uh, who is recognized as a teacher in the White Lotus sect, except that the sect is said to be, quote, dedicated to ridding China of the emperor, which seems like a sort of a mashup of both the Qing rebellion and the PRC um, revolutionary account. Uh, Wang's involvement uh, with Qi Lin is driven both by her love for Qi Lin and uh, by their common cause. Uh, and I quote here, their shared hatred for the cruelty and corruption that Qing officials represented fueled their passions for each other and their commitment to those officials' downfalls. Uh, in keeping with a kind of romantic theme to this uh, representation, uh, after Qi Lin's death, Wang is represented as being plunged into a well of despair and anguish. Uh, she wears white into revolt, which was, as I mentioned earlier, was kind of a common um, marker of uh, rebel identity. In this telling, uh, white is a symbol of her mourning for her husband. Uh, she's represented as a kind nurse to wounded soldiers and also possessed of a, quote, iron discipline in battle. And uh, in the inevitable scene when she is finally trapped by the Qing army on a cliff, she chooses to join her husband in death. That is another quote. Um, however, uh, her death was not for nothing. As narrated by Lucy Lawless in the conclusion of the episode, one struggle spawned another 150 years of rebellion culminating in Mao's 1949 revolution. So that's quite a... Um, distinction uh, for Wong in this respect. Uh, just to make a final comment on this before I wrap up, um, the Warrior Woman segment does follow the general outline of uh, Wong's biography, um, but nevertheless, it's important to point out that like these other accounts, it's adding sort of new layers of representation to Wong's persona. Um, and in this uh, 
representation in particular, um, what I remark on is the sentimentality that is attributed um, to Wong. Uh, my impression on watching this is that although Wong is motivated by her anger against corruption or the corrupt reign of the Qing dynasty, um, her actions seem to be largely motivated by her affection for her husband. And in this, I actually saw a similarity to the older um, Disney Mulan version from the animated one from 1999, um, where that Mulan gets very caught up in sort of a romantic attachment uh, to her male counterpart. Uh, and here too, we see a representation of Wang Sungar where she's primarily motivated um, by her love and affection for her husband. So, uh, there's more to say, I think, about um, these different representations and, and uh, the reasons behind them. Uh, but I think I'll maybe uh, wrap up and leave that for the question and answer period. So I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cecily, for that wonderful presentation. I personally, um, I'm not that familiar with Chinese history. So in addition to learning about the historical piece and kind of different representations as well as the modern take on it, I just found it very fascinating. So thank you for, for presenting today for us and sharing your, your research with our audience. Um, I'm opening at the Q&A up to anybody out there in our audience. Please use our Q&A feature um, use the box to submit any questions. Um, and we will spend probably 20 minutes or so answering um, questions. Um, I also see some comments here showing up. So people are welcome to submit comments in the comment box. Um, a question here, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name correctly, but um, Tian Chu Lo. So um, this person writes, Thank you for exposing the new Pantina of the Wong story, um, Bravo. The woman warrior narration desecrates the Mulan legend. Cecily, any comments on um, the warrior woman narration and how it might desecrate the Mulan legend? Sure. Um, I think it, yeah, I, the there's it seems like there's so many different factors that one might think about when thinking in particular about this sort of uh, the latter day representation of um, both Wang Songar and Mulan. It, it see, I mean, I I'd love to uh, maybe hear a little bit more about that comment um, sure. from the our attendee, but. Uh, I think of things like the ways in which it takes advantage of sort of a martial arts epic tradition in film. There is actually a segment in the Warrior Woman um, series where there's kind of a, a, a five minute interlude of um, basically a martial arts uh, exercise that's definitely suggesting that we should place Wong Sung are in this tradition of sort of martial arts epics. And while I think that that's true of the ways in which uh, literary uh, writers have placed Wong Sung are, it's, it's definitely moving away from what we might say is the veracity of the original. So in terms of historical accuracy, I would say yes, it's um, these, these representations have a lot more to do with a contemporary audience than they do with historical veracity. I completely agree. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jeff Kinkley asks, and first off, thank you, Professor McCaffrey. Very informative. Any historical cross-fertilization with pirates of the late 19th century of South China and Vietnam, which may have had some female rebels as against the French? I'm just curious. Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that I'd like to do with this project is to um, bring people through these different representations and think about the ways in which um, 
we've got all these different attributes applied through writing, but then just to bring it back to the historical context. So one thing that we do know is that it was very common for women to be involved in these kinds of movements. Uh, there are a number of um, women uh, who act as leaders during the White Lotus Uprising. Uh, and perhaps even more common, um, because these rebels were so strictly persecuted by the Qing state, actually, even prior to the rebellion, um, during the campaign against the popular religious groups, but also certainly heightened during the rebellion itself, that the, an entire family would have to follow the rebels. I mean, families, that rebel compounds were often composed of um, just entire families, men, women, children. And um, just as would be true um, in any society, all men members took up um, necessary roles, whether that be gathering food and support or, um, you know, leading troops into battle. Um, we do have some official reports of female rebel leaders. So I, um, my knowledge of the South um, China piracy is, is relatively limited. I've just read a, a uh, a couple of um, works on that. I'm thinking of Diane Murray's work, for example, on the South China Pirates. So um, I, I don't know much more than just being able to make a casual illusion, but in my mind, uh, we don't have as much um, historical information about women's activities, um, just as we don't have much historical information about non-elite activities um, in this time period, um, because the, the written record is what persists. Um, but certainly evidence does seem to indicate that it's not at all unusual for women to be um, involved and play leadership roles in rebel movements. Jim Mockford asks, you mentioned the portrait of Mulan in the West by Disney and the impact on the Woman Warrior series, et cetera. But are there contemporary film or Chinese programs in China that feature Wang Kao Er? Oh, and he also wished he had asked Jeff Kingley's question earlier. So are there any representations right now in, um, in China? Sure. Um, so there was um, kind of a flush of publishing about Wang in the um, uh, like early 1980s in the People's Republic. And it included histories, um, one of which actually titled the White Lotus Rebellion, like the Wong Songar Uprising actually. Um, but there was also um, a novel produced called Swordswoman in White, uh, which took up Wong and, uh, and her activities in the White Lotus Rebellion as sort of the historical backdrop. Drop. It is a fictional account, um, but I have seen there is a, um, movie that's made in Hong Kong, a martial arts film in the 1980s uh, that's uh, called Swordswoman in White. Um, I think it's by E. Nusha. I'll have to, I can, I'll try to remember to, I can, if you follow up with me, I can get you the actual Chinese title of that. Um, but the Swordswoman in White uh, <clears throat> feature film is actually, um, follows the novel that was produced in the mid 1980s. And that too has a lot of martial arts attributes. Um, it actually, the opening scene of the movement is actually the Wong Songar character leaping off of a hill, um, sort of evoking that previous image of Wong leaping off of a cliff. Those are the ones that I know about. I do periodically <laughs> do Google searches just to see if I can find any um, other references. I see a lot of, um, you definitely see sort of short posts um, and um, things uh, sort of on different blog posts about Wong Sungar, but they tend to be sort of brief and repetitive. So I haven't seen other feature length um, kinds of representations, at least on my short searches. Okay, another question here. So Letha Tani asks, the Disney animated Mulan represents the Huns as barbarian others. In the post Qing narratives around Huang Kar Ar, are the Manchus ever presented in a similar way? Hmm. Yeah, um, great question. Uh, the certainly, as I uh, mentioned briefly in the presentation, the um, sense of the Qing um, representing, you know, kind of the feudal corrupt order um, does, I think, have some parallels to this idea of like an alien or foreign other, um, except that the distinction is being made between like a corrupt past and a um, liberated present, shall we say. Um, there, I have seen some 
mentions of one of uh, another rebel who is associated with Wong um, putting forth a sort of anti-Manchu slogans that seem to focus on the Qing uh, rulers, Manchu ethnicity specifically. But I haven't really seen in my own um, research, I haven't seen a lot of reference to kind of a, a directly anti-Qing anti-Manchu slant. You would you see that in 19th century rebellions, the Taiping Rebellion, of course, is very famous um, for literally demonizing the, the Qing Manchu leaders as being barbarian others who are um, leading China astray. And that comes up again um, in uh, 1911 revolutionary rhetoric as well, this sort of alienation of um, the Qing. But when it comes to the historical record, I have not seen a lot of reference to that kind of ethnically slanted representation. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Leslie Atia writes, Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior novel was my first original introduction to Chinese people's experience in the US. Do you have any insights which on do you have any insights on which representation of Wong Kon Er upon which Miss Kingston may have relied? Any uh, insights? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I don't, but I would love to. I would love to know. Um, I, I the only thing I can offer is just sort of an anecdote. Um, so when I was in graduate school. Again, this is like 20 years ago. <laughs> Time passes. Um, you know, I, I, I could argue like Wong Song R kind of got me into this research topic. I was really interested in um, rebellion in China, especially rebellions like the Taiping Rebellion that I just mentioned in the mid 19th century. And uh, a classmate of mine who had grown up in China um, so it was about my age. I'm 50. So we're about, we were about the same age, I guess, growing up, uh, sort of maybe seeing some stuff in the late 70s and early 80s. She was saying, oh, um, you know, you should think about Wong Songar. And I said, who? Like, I've never heard of this um, <clears throat> figure before. And uh, so it was beginning to research Wong Songar that led me into the rebellion um, more generally. Um, and you know, sort of to close the loop on this particular presentation, um, I actually didn't find enough about Wong Sungar to merit like thorough research because I thought, well, every there's sort of nothing there. It's just these representations, but there's no real historical source. And so instead I turned to the broader account of the rebellion and became involved in that. But this is a very roundabout way of saying, well, given that my colleague who was growing up in China in the 1970s was seeing these representations of Wong Sung R makes me wonder about the ways in which um, some of those things might have been passed on or communicated or shared. And so I, I certainly wouldn't exclude the possibility that uh, Maxine Hong Kingston had seen um, those uh, some of those representations, if not of Wong specifically, then of other female revolutionary heroines. Um, and certainly the iconography of the People's Republic is one in which um, women are featured very prominently in um, propaganda posters that are seeking to really pull together um, the entire nation. So, sorry, it's not a wonderful answer. It's a great question, but that's sort of the where I might tie things together. Jeff Kinkley asked another question. He's wondering if you're familiar with James Millward's recent writing on the Mulan legend? And if so, could you comment on his views? I have not seen that. So I'm going to have to look that up. I'm sorry, I can't offer more. Okay, great. Um, Dennis Lee uh, on our first Saturday committee writes, when and why did you become interested in Wong Song Er? And is this topic part of your perhaps doctoral dissertation? Yeah, um, so that anecdote I just shared about my classmate, that was sort of the first um, pathway into the topic. Um, and uh, so she, I make short reference to um, Wong's involvement in the rebellion in my doctoral dissertation, which was actually about the White Lotus Uprising um, in uh, Hubei province, that province that I showed in my presentation. Uh, so uh, she's an important figure among 
many. Uh, I have always been interested in uh, non-elite perspectives on history. And so studying <coughs> rebellion is a good way to um, acquire some of those perspectives. So in some ways you could say that Wong sort of led me um, in that particular direction. I will say there have been, um, recently there has, has been the publication of a very comprehensive history of the White Lotus uprising um, in a book called The White Lotus War that was just published last year by University of Washington Press. It's by a woman named Ing Sung Dai, who's a professor of history at William Patterson University. And um, she has done this amazing comprehensive study of just, she's read, it must be 100,000 pages of Chinese uh, Qing Dynasty documentation um, on the rebellion. So there's increasingly, there's, there's more and more um, information. So she gives a great overview of um, the rebellion itself. And, but she too, you know, mentions Wong as a, as an actor, but we really, in terms of those resources, we just have so little information about who she was. Okay. Um, here's a, another question that kind of gets back to more, you mentioned who the real Wong really was. And this, um, person is asking, do we know anything about how her family, her real family, might have been affected by her participation in the cause? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, great question. So I, um, most of the reports that we see about Wong's family um, are are anecdotal and after the fact and seem to be based on sort of a, a, a removed um, removed access. The, I, I have seen um, one elite publication uh, where uh, the author who had actually served in the Qing armies with um, one of the Qing commanders who had been in pursuit of Wang um, was not the one who actually captured her, but certainly would have been involved in battles with a larger um, group. And he's one of the ones who suggests, who or makes the first suggestion that I found that she was indeed from uh, a family of itinerant performers. So there is a, a possibility that that is in fact um, based uh, in truth. The In terms of thinking about the larger implications of um, her involvement in rebellion, it would actually go back to her involvement in um, the religious organization itself, that we know that the um, state prosecution of these groups, uh, and this was based on a state fear that these groups would indeed rise in rebellion, which ended up happening. Um, so we know that entire families would essentially flee for fear that they would be caught up in this larger um, campaign against the religious groups. And at least in theory, the way that um, local suppression was supposed to work in this time period was um, on the basis of household responsibility systems so that entire families can kind of be pulled in for interrogation if they were searching for a particular member or entire families would be um, subject to punishment for involvement in these movements. So it was a pretty broad um, reach in that respect. So when I think about sort of hypothetically what might have happened to Wong's own family in the course of the rebellion or the religious persecution. Um, certainly they would have probably wanted to go into hiding, um, if not actually join in rebellion specifically. And there are cases in the record of um, well-known rebel leaders who are accompanied by their families and their wives actually end up taking on fairly prominent roles within the rebel organization themselves. Um, on the flip side, I've also read accounts of rebel leaders who abandon the cause in part because they've lost all of their family, that their, their family members have been killed as a result of the rebellion and they, they surrender themselves um, to the Qing troops sort of out of despair in a sense. So certainly people would have been like pulled in or it would have been hard to avoid the implications of the rebellion if you were a family member. Well, thank you for explaining that. And it is kind of interesting that we have a little bit um, of an account on her family, yeah. later, even if it was later. Um, here's a question. Somebody writes, pardon me for um, asking this if it was already covered, I joined late. But um, 
at what was uh, Wong's age range during um, her involvement in the rebellion? Um, how old was she when she died? How long was um, her involvement in, in this rebellion as well? Mm -hmm. So um, I, what I've seen is the um, more, um, the, the, again, the sort of secondhand accounts, uh, they always put Wong's age at being relatively young. So the PRC sources, for example, um, have her uh, being about 20 years old when she's involved in the rebellion. And another um, Qing representation likewise has her involved at a quite young age. I didn't um, excerpt that for the talk today, so I can't quite remember what that was, but generally the, the, um, the impression is that she was quite young. She um, was involved, um, we know just because her husband, Shilin was caught up in these earlier persecutions um, and she was married to him at that time. So she would have been involved um, at least since um, seven, prior to 1794 and then she died in 1798. So she was involved in the rebellion um, I think technically it began in early 1796 and um, she was captured in the fall of 1798, maybe the spring, but at least two or three years um, of direct involvement. Okay. Dennis Lee asked another question. Was there any historical connotation between Wong and the last Qing Dowager Empress in terms of the roles of females in China? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> um, uh, the, I mean, the distinction, um, of course, is the sort of the, the elite versus non-elite element. Um, the Empress Dowager is quite notable for her, um, her sort of journey into power, um, namely sort of becoming the regent of um, her young son who is named emperor, um, but then also retaining power basically through the end of her life through various um, machinations. Basically, it's quite clear. I'm not an expert on the Empress Dowager, but it's quite clear from the narrative that she was um, extremely politically adept and, um, and in significant control of the court uh, and was able to perpetuate her power um, quite directly in that way. So Wong is, a, is a, to me as a historian anyway, is a very different kind of figure. Um, and in some ways, I think my own personal belief is that Wong is probably more typical um, and the Empress Dowager is more extraordinary. And what I mean by that is that um, I think a lot of people um, who were not elites in Chinese society did subscribe to a variety of A, religious beliefs, B, social organizations. And when they ran astray of, uh, of the law or um, social norms, uh, that they would then uh, take action to defend themselves and, sort of, and be resilient in that respect. So I think Wong's involvement to me, I guess at this point almost seems like just a natural part of um, non-elite Chinese society, which is not to say that everybody goes out in rebellion, but rather that she was involved in movements that many people would have been involved in. It's just that in her case, those movements led to a very public role. Thank you. It looks like we have time for a couple more questions. I see one here from Joanne Wakeland, and perhaps we could take another question um, from anyone after this. So this is kind of a comment um, from Joanne, and she's also maybe asking for your, um, your response. Um, she says, I was struck by the pheasant feather headdress and the red brocade war robe in the depiction and its similarity to representations of Sun Wukong. I was wondering if um, you had any comments or if you also saw the similarity in representation. Yeah, um, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised that you've, that you've noted that. Uh, I um, have been very reliant on um, a number of really, there's, there's a lot of wonderful writing um, in uh, Chinese literary and cultural studies about this tradition of um, the female uh, martial artist or the female knight errant. And um, 
so I wouldn't be surprised that there are kind of signal characteristics for the readers that um, what you're noting, Joanne, is probably what a contemporary Chinese reader of that account would have seen, like the sort of the signals like, oh, I know what that is. I know what that reference is, that they're able to pick up just from these inferences, the larger context of, oh, this author is putting Wang Song R into this larger tradition of um, female knight errants and the like, or drawing references that the knowledgeable reader will see. Um, this is, uh, I when I move into studies of literature, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, um, I often feel out of my depth. Um, it's such a rich tradition and I don't have a lot of experience in it. Um, but this, it, certainly that's my impression is that in these accounts, there, there, there's just a richness of cultural tropes and references that an educated audience would have picked up on the influences um, really quickly. So obviously you can count yourself among their number. Well, thank you, Cecily. Thank it you. looks like we've answered um, all of the questions. Um, and if I accidentally skipped over somebody's, my apologies, um, questions kind of come in and it's a little bit tricky to keep track of them all. Um, we are at the end of our um, time that we've allotted today. So again, I'd like to say thank you very much, um, Cecily, for today's fantastic um, presentation. Um, also like to thank our audience for um, taking your mornings to join us. Um, we'd like to invite people to join us next month. And um, next month we have a speaker new also to First Saturday named Brian Dot. He is from um, Whitman College and he'll be talking about the history of chili peppers in China. Um, we also uh, have our first Saturday tea house scheduled after a short break, after we conclude. And so please, as a reminder there, um, we ask people to exit this webinar, go back to the email confirmation, and then click on the tea house if you'd like to join us for the optional tea house. So again, Cecily, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I'm, can't remember if you are willing or able to be in our tea house, but if you are, I look forward to seeing you shortly um, in that. So again, everybody, thank you for joining us and we hope you, hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. I will be in the tea house, so I look forward to meeting some of you. Okay, great. <laughs>